Okay, I'm so thrilled to welcome Hannah Welton um, to the interview today. Thank you, Hannah, for being part of this. We're thrilled to have you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be a part of such an amazing, amazing movement and vision. Well, thank you so much. I'm just going to get right started. I sent you, uh, I sent you a few uh, options for questions, and we're yeah. just going to try to barrel through the list and see what we can All get righty. Let's okay. do it. Um, first thing, can you tell us how you got started in drumming? Why did you choose drums over some other instrument? Yeah, so um, when I was in elementary school, I went to Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary School in Louisville, Kentucky, and um, I, there's they're actually pretty well known now as the Louisville Leopard Percussionists. It's a group of, you know, maybe 40 to 50 kids, I think, um, that just learn songs by ear and it's all percussion instruments xylophone marimba congas all types of latin percussion drum set and back in that time we were known as the fabulous leopard percussionist and the group is led by diane downs and back uh when i was in the group it was actually based out of martin luther king jr elementary school and if you were in diane's class she was our language arts teacher and if you were in her class in break time or after we finished our assignments for fun she had these percussion instruments set up and it would just be like okay we've got some downtime let's go jam let's go learn percussion and nice. if you if you learned and you wanted to you had the option of auditioning to be in the fabulous leopard percussionist and you know I grew up I started dancing at three I have older siblings that are dancers my father um, was a was a musician he played trumpet for a long long time uh, and so music and entertainment and just the arts were very very um, prominent in my family I'm one of six kids and okay. I'm number four. So we grew up in a very loud home, very entertaining home. And uh, when I learned how to play percussion, I fell in love with it. And that was at seven years old in elementary okay. school. And I auditioned for the group. I got in and that was really, that's it. game over. <laughs> that's fantastic. So did you play mm -hmm. all the way through elementary, junior high, high school in um, bands? And did you drum line? Oh my gosh, yes. So um, that was in elementary school. I was in the Fabulous Leopard Percussionist. And because at that time it was based in the elementary school, when you went on to middle school, you had to um, retire from the oh. percussion group. And I am telling you, it was one of my first true heartbreaks to have to let go of because I just loved the group so much. And um, it really was like family. And so once I went on to middle school, I joined middle school band and then in high school I was in orchestra I was in a uh, concert band I was um, definitely in jazz band um, starting sophomore year because freshman year I had just missed the cut for auditions because I was new we moved and I, I was like new and registration and all that and I missed the deadline so sophomore year I was in jazz band and freshman through senior year I was on drum line and I loved it it was my favorite, I think out of all the high school music experiences, drumline and marching band in general, it was just my favorite time of the school year with yeah. all the football games and just the thrill and the rush of being on the drumline and everyone's waiting for you to take the field. And it's just so cool. So yeah, I played snare all four years on drumline. That's line. fantastic. That's fantastic. I love that. I didn't get to play on drumline because in oh, our man. school, you either had to choose, I was a vocal major in college. So you had to choose, oh, wow. um, do you, do you go this way or that way? You didn't get to play everything. So right. I chose voice so that I could play drums behind the band when I'm not soloing and that kind of thing. So, or the, mm -hmm. the choir. So I miss drum line. I didn't get to do that, but yeah. I did get to play in like jazz band and stuff. So darn it. So I, did, I didn't get to have that experience. Um, oh, okay, it was so a lot of fun. I am, I'm sure all of my friends were in band. So I got to like through osmosis, enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So in, in, in college, what was your college experience? Where did you go to college for music? I did. I went to uh, Chicago college of performing arts and I was a jazz drum set, just jazz performance major drum set was my instrument of choice, of course. Um, and I went for two years. Um, Paul Wertico was my private instructor, my, my just drum lesson teacher for my last 
I want to say my last two years of high school. So I started working with Paul Wertico and he was also the head of the jazz department at Chicago College of Performing Arts. And when I was in that transition of leaving high school, do I go to college or just do I move to LA to perform and get some session work and really just go after my dreams? And um, I applied to Berkeley and CCPA, Chicago College of Performing Arts, and got into both, received scholarships from both. But after talking with Paul and also my dad, of course, um, we just kind of felt like it was best for me to stay in Chicago at that time um, because I was already in a working band. So I was gigging on the weekends already, but was able to stay close to home, close to my dad, close to all my gear. Um, and of course, uh, to Paul, and I could continue learning from Paul for a few extra years and, and really hone in on my chops and really kind of get the best of both worlds in regards mm -hmm. to education and performance experience. And so that's what I did. And I loved it. I also, as you mentioned, being a vocalist, I, even though I was studying jazz drums, I, um, also joined eventually the vocal department too and did some jazz vocal stuff and nice. um it was an amazing amazing program and they really just throw you in there and and have you learn you know with your hands I had to take even though I was a jazz drum set major and it was so it was performance major um I still had to learn classical theory before I could learn jazz theory I had to learn classical piano I think it was the first year um so the first yeah, the first year we did classical and uh, classical theory and piano. And that theory also entailed um, written theory, but also listening and being able to sight sing and sight read and all that sort of stuff. And then mm -hmm. sophomore year was when we finally were able to enter into jazz theory and jazz piano, which was a whole nother animal. Oh, yeah. And so um, the combo program, um, every semester you were placed in a new combo and every, each combo was different um, based on the era and the style in which it played in the history of jazz. So there was hard bop, there was bebop, there was fusion, there was Latin combo, there was Brazilian combo, swing combo, uh, and, and so, so much fun. So many different um, genres and stuff at our, our disposal. And I was also in the Latin ensemble program. Um, and then I was the, I think, I don't really hold on to these titles, but I think I was technically the first freshman to actually audition and hold the seat for the big band um, okay. uh, for the college too. So I was, it was amazing. Such an, an awesome two years. That's yes. a huge, that's a huge education. Um, okay. So what was your, you said that you had already been in a gigging band. So what was that experience? How did you get that gig? Yeah, so um, I was born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, my parents split when I was about 12 years old, and I actually moved to Chicago with my dad and my little brother at that time, and pretty much right away, um, like I had said before, I was a dancer, and my sister was already established in Chicago. She's a professional dancer as well, and so at the dance studio that she was teaching at, my little brother and I just joined it because of course there were family connections and we love to dance. And um, that's where we decided to go. So I was dancing already. And some of the um, other girls that I danced with, their dad um, was a professional guitar player. And he was, he had bands and stuff that he played with in the Chicagoland area. And so I just kind of started to get tied in with different musicians mm -hmm. over time. And my dad took, uh, he's been my manager my whole career. And so mm -hmm. he took that move seriously as well, because obviously if you compare markets, Chicago is a little bit, you know, better or more happening than the Louisville market for live right. music. And so um, my dad was serious about networking and making those connections as well. And so um, we ended up auditioning together to join a blues band um, mm -hmm. and we got in. And so I was this 12 year old little girl auditioning for a blues band with my daddy. <laughs> he played trumpet and we got it. And so we're gigging around the city of Chicago That's and I'm hilarious. playing in bars with these old guys, you know, at 12 years old on That's the weekends, crazy. you know, when my friends are going to the skating rink or going to the movies <laughs> right. or whatever, I'm like, sorry, I gotta go gig and <laughs> um, playing drums behind these old guys, but it was so much fun. And so, so that what was, experience. 
I mean, what an experience for you. A lot of people yes. play play almost all their lives and don't get to have that experience. So what a wonderful yes. thing for you. What it really great. was great. And I, I wouldn't trade it for the world because I, I mean, I'm a daddy's girl anyway. So to sure. be able to spend all that time with my dad and have him really show me the ropes of, you know, what we can learn from those experiences, because also at 12, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have sort of raised their brow at that parental decision for my dad to have me in bars, you know, at such a young age, but I was always with him. I was never away from him. And when I would ask questions about different things that I would see, certain behaviors, certain choices that people would make, he was very honest with me. And he would just say, you know, you learn a lot about what not to do you know, in life. And, and those were critical learning experiences for me too. So it was fun. I loved Absolutely. it. Absolutely. That's wonderful. And that's how I know you is through your dad. Your dad and I were Facebook friends and that's, oh, that's wow. how I, that, I mean, I, I had, I did yet. Yeah. Um, I, I knew him and I knew you, but I didn't know that you two were daughter dad. Oh, wow. Yes. Um, yeah. That's so, my daddy. Yeah. He's, a, he's an awesome guy. He's okay. a great guy. Um, I read through your bio and I got to say that's one of the most impressive bios that I have ever read in my life. Thank you. Wow. Um, Thank so you. you've you've had to have some drummers that were inspirational to you for you to get to the point that you're at. Who are some of those people? You know, I actually had to sit and, and write them down and I tried to keep it super, <laughs> you know, concise because I could go on and on. Oh, um, yeah. The first drummer that I really, when I was getting serious about really learning um, how to play the drums, the first one that I really dissected as a player was John Bonham. And I got, I just dove in and tried to get even into his mind as far as why he made some of the decisions that he made as a musician. Because when you listen to John Bonham, one thing that we will all always walk away with is the conviction that he played with every time. He meant every note that he played. And um, on top of that, you know, his techniques, his chops, his feel, he's got such a unique feel because it's not completely straight, you know, rhythmically. And it's also not completely swung. He sat in that middle ground and, mm-hmm. and gelled the two worlds so beautifully. Yeah. Um, and so just his feel, I really dove into his fills his decisions why he played what he played when he did certain things I dove into him and he's been a huge influence of mine um on top of that you know jazz wise I had the opportunity of meeting Louis Belson at a really young age from being in the the fabulous leopard percussionists we would go to you know PASIC um, the Percussive Arts Society International Convention every year growing up. And we performed with Louis in one of his clinics. And I met him then. I think it might have been either in 90, I think it was in 1999. And I was nine at that time. And and after that, I also had entered his um, drum heritage. Um, I think it was drum heritage contest, his, his little, his drum competition for um people in Illinois and I won that and so kind of reconnected with him and got to spend some really cool one-on-one time with him that I'll treasure forever um and so Louis Louis was always a big um influence for me also because I believe he was the first jazz drummer to really bring in the double bass concept and um I think he even created double bass and so um as a rocker at heart and I started to dive into the jazz world. Um, I thought it was really cool to see a jazz player playing double bass because, you know, I always saw it as this like thrashing, you know, thing that that rockers did. And to hear him do it so tastefully, I thought it was really cool. Um, Paul Wordico, I've mentioned already, who he played with the Pat Metheny group. And um, because I got to spend so much intimate time with him in lessons and stuff for years, I mean, it was consistent um, every week. Um, for four years and then the first two of those I was in high school but then the second two I was actually on campus with him saw him every day um uh and so I'll I mean he's he really is one of those players that will challenge um take okay sorry I thought it told me my mic was muted I'm sorry he's one of those players that will really kick you outside of your comfort zone creatively 
but still make you feel comfortable. It's really weird. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, he's a very uh, creative outside of the box thinker. Um, Even just with some of the attachments that he'll add into the drum set itself. You know, I remember seeing him at a show (laughs) where he was performing and doing a drum solo and he's playing and just killing but then all of a sudden he bends over and we don't see him. And he throws this big piece of tarp over him and the drum set without missing a beat. And he's like hitting on the tarp and playing on the drum set. And you can hear this tarp making like, you know, that kind of <laughs> noise. And it added so much um, visually, but also audibly. And it was just a really cool concept where I'm not sure that there will ever be another drummer or musician to think about, okay, let me just add this tarp. You know, <laughs> it was like, he was just walking around the stage looking for things to just bring in at the last minute. And he found this piece of tarp, but it was so cool. And as my mentor, he really challenged me to, to think outside the box like that and to be okay with, you know, changing up the status quo and, and to experiment. And so Uh, I loved spending time with him and he also really took me into the jazz world and and I remember some of those first couple lessons with him because I grew up a a rock head Uh, he would ask me you know you know Elvin Jones and I was like who Elvin who and he was like hold the phone just (laughs) stop right here and go through a jazz history course and that's what we did I remember there were lessons where even though, you know, it was blocked out for just an hour at a time, he, we would go for two hours and my dad, you know, he'd come to pick me up after, after that hour was up and Paul would just invite him in. And I mean, we would go hours and not even play, but just listen and talk about and dissect all these different drummers and just these eras of music. And, and so he put me on to Papa Joe Jones, who, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the first time I saw him, I didn't even have to hear what he was playing, but it was so, it was like a connection for me personally, because I've always been so happy and smiley and bubbly and um, growing up, you don't see a lot of drummers like that. Mm -hmm. And so for a while, I thought that as a drummer, it had to be a part of my persona to not smile and to look gnarly and, (laughs) you know, kind of mad at the world. And um, when I saw Papa Joe Jones for the first time, it sparked something in me where it was like okay I can be myself I can be happy I can show that I love what I'm doing right now um Art Blakey is another one I love Tony Williams another one um and then Ruben Alvarez he's a Latin percussionist that I was able to have some um you know uh one-on-one time with as well from a very young age um and then of course I've got to go there Karen Carpenter yeah um golly I mean queen she is yes. queen for me yeah. um her voice I mean she is one of those who could have either had a very successful drumming career or could have had a very successful singing career and the fact that she chose to blend the two even though her passion was drums she embraced that beautiful voice of hers as well and really mm-hmm. set such an amazing example for singing drummers and just women empowerment and, you know, being okay with um, uh, just leading the band from the throne, but also, you know, stepping out and not having to rely on that instrument. I know sometimes for instrumentalists, it's very easy for us to get, to get comfortable behind our instrument. Mm -hmm. And so I've heard so many stories about you know, instrumentalists that can also sing, but when they step away from their instrument, they feel really vulnerable and nervous Mm -hmm. to just sing. And so for her to really set that example, I mean, I love her. She's one of my favorite voices of all time, even just so beautiful. And last but not least, Prince, um, he actually uh, was a phenomenal drummer and extremely funky and helped my playing and just understanding of funk landslides, landslides. And so I will forever be grateful for that man and his friendship and his mentorship and just his example in my okay. life. Let's talk about that because most people that Let's. know know you're playing, they know you from, hey, she played with Prince. What a cool gig that was. So how did that yes. come about? Yeah. So 
Um, my husband Joshua and I got married in 2011 and just 21 year old kids and after we got married we moved down to Atlanta um, to kind of start fresh and the music scene down there we heard was really popping off and we had friends down there that opened up their home to us um, and we're just sort of like hey you guys are musicians you're newlyweds we want y'all to be able to focus on your careers and your marriage so come down here stay with us rent free you know we want to invest in you know your relationship and your your careers and all that sort of stuff so it was you know we went down there all bright-eyed and youthful and excited and so as we started to meet people down there we actually got plugged into a church um, where we were serving in the teen ministry um, and uh, it's World Changers Church down there in Atlanta Creflo Dollars Church and uh, what a phenomenal ministry and experience that was and um, at that time I had gotten this super cryptic email and or uh, yes email um, and she just said hi, uh, my name is so-and-so and and I work for a very well-known musician and he came across some of your YouTube videos and really likes your playing and was wondering if you'd be willing to audition for an up-and-coming project he has. And uh, first, you know, we got to know if you can keep a secret. That was it. That's all the email said. And so at that point, you know, my, my social media numbers had started to climb. I had just crossed the threshold of a million views, I think on one of my videos. And so I was starting to get more and more requests <laughs> and cryptic messages from people. And most of the time I just kind of, if they were super weird, I kind of just ignored them and mm-hmm. didn't respond. Um, Cause you don't know how to take that stuff sometimes. Yeah, and sure. But this time I responded and I, I just said, hi, you know, thank you for reaching out. I'm so, I'm so glad that you, you know, enjoy my stuff. Um, I can definitely keep a secret, but before I commit to anything, I need to know a little bit more information. And they wrote back the next day and it happened to be on a Sunday. It was after church service, but we were rehearsing and stuff with the, with the kids for um, their drama club and stuff like that. And I got this email and she said, okay, great. Well, I work for Prince and, you know, he would love for you to send some videos, you know, to, to see your playing and, and, you know, audition for this project of his. And, um, I freaked out. I freaked out. I immediately was screaming like a crazy lady running through the hallways of the church, looking for Joshua. And I finally (laughs) found him. And I just said to him, look at this email. I don't know if it's real, but if it's not, this is so cool. And um, it turns out it was very real. And so they sent me three songs, I think it was, to record drum videos to and send back. And then when I sent that back, they asked if I could sing and wanted to hear a video of me singing. And I did that. And then the next step was, can you come to Paisley? And Paisley Park Studios, for those of you that may not know, that's that's where Prince lived, that it's out here in Minnesota. Um, it's the studio that, you know, we recorded at, we worked at, it was his, his studio. So um, they flew me out to Paisley all by myself, which was also, a, that was a, a very grown up thing that I had to do because I was yeah. used to traveling with my dad. And then if my dad wasn't available for shows or touring or whatever, Joshua came with me and I had asked, I literally said, is it possible to get my dad or my husband to come with me? Because, you know, typically I like to travel, you know, with one of them. And uh, they said, nah, no, not this time. But it was super respectful. They just kind of said, we would just, we would love for you to just come. And the next time, you know, your husband can join you or, or however that went about. So I went out there all by myself in my big girl pants. (laughs) And, um, this 22 year old kid at that point, I had just turned 22 a couple weeks before. And whew, I was, I did not know what to expect because yeah. you hear so many stories about Prince and how mysterious he was and how weird he was as an artist. And do you call him Prince or, you know, do you just call him the symbol, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like, how do you refer to him? Don't look him in the eye. Don't wear this. Don't say that. Definitely don't have your phone out. And so I didn't know what to expect. And I just kind of 
like pumped myself up and I said, you know what, Hannah, you're a likable girl. Just go in there and be yourself. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, God's got something even better for you. And um, that's kind of how I went about it and um, flew out there to Minnesota, my first first class flight. And when Julia, who was his manager at the time, she's the one that sent me those emails and stuff. She picked me up at the airport and he had told her to call him once she had picked me up. And so she called him and uh, gave the phone to me. And, and I just was so like this, just a little girl. Hello. And said, <laughs> How is your flight? And I said, oh, it was so good. It was my first, first class flight. They had this whole meal for me. I was given a chicken sandwich. I went on and on about every detail of my first, first class flight. And I didn't even realize he was a vegetarian at the time. And, you know, there was this like hard, no meat rule in Paisley. And I'm telling him about my delicious chicken sandwich that I had just so oblivious but at the same time it was I think that's part of what he really loved about Joshua and I is that we were just so authentically real and we um genuinely embraced every moment and loved and lived in every moment that we had with him and he constantly surrounded himself with with um young people or um it wasn't even necessarily always about age as much as it was about mentality because mm-hmm. you can be older, but still have a young and thriving and refreshing mentality. And he had that and, and he wanted that around him. And so that was a little bit of the, the first time that I had met him and talked with him. And um, uh, I'll, I, I'll stop there. And if you want to know more, we can go into more about, you know, when I went into to the studio and, and met him in person, but I don't want to. I do have a question about that. There's a, that's so funny. I love that about you because you were just being (laughs) you and that's so cool. And and that's who we need to be. I tell people all the time, just be transparent, be authentic. And the people that are supposed to be in your life are going to love you for that. And they're going to support you for that. So anyway, good on you. Um, I did want to ask you about that because a lot of the girls in my group, Um, they are really comfortable with say playing at home or they're good at playing um, in front of people but when Mm -hmm. they transition to playing in a studio that's a harder transition so can you talk about the transition that you had from going to playing a drumline playing in all of these bands and things like that to going into now a studio a very professional situation what was that transition for you yeah yeah Um, That's a good question. You know, at a very young age, because I started dancing at three, I've always loved the ability to be able to express myself through performance. And so dancing, singing, and then eventually drumming and playing in bands and being in front of people. And even in rehearsals, my dad had always really emphasized the importance of um, giving your all and approaching every opportunity to play as an equal opportunity. So whether I was gigging in a bar that, you know, was super small, um, crowded, but only had three people in it, or, you know, the dreams that I had of playing in front of 30,000 people, he said, I want you to play to those three, like they're the 30,000 you're dreaming about. Yeah. And so I, at a young age, was always taught to embrace every opportunity and give my all for it. And so when it came time to go into the studio, um, I was kind of nervous, especially the studio with Prince. I had recorded in the studio in previous bands and stuff like that. So I had a little bit of recording experience, but when you're talking (laughs) about recording with an icon who Mm -hmm. literally, you know, is known for being able to record his entire album himself, um, you know, how do you go into that session? And so again, it was one of those moments, hey, you're here for a reason. He sees something in you that he appreciates and wants on this project. And so I even approached the studio performances as, I don't know, I guess live performances in a way. And I mean, I don't know if it, how familiar, you know, everybody is with me as a performer, but I get into these zones where I'll just close my eyes 
And Joshua always talks about when you just throw your head back and close your eyes and smile, that's my favorite because I know you're just in the moment and that's when you, that's when it crosses over. And, you know, that's, there's those special moments for me. And so a lot of times if I need to get out of my head and out of any sort of nerves or negative thoughts or questions or doubt, I'll go there. I'll close my eyes and just thank God for the moment that I'm in. Thank him for this opportunity and know that, um, you know, I'm here for a reason and for a purpose. And, um, for me, that's sort of my, um, that threshold, the threshold that sort of launches me into where I need to be in the present is like, okay, close your eyes and imagine yourself in front of a room of people, close your eyes, listen to the musicians you're recording with, and then lock eyes with them and jams like with Plectrum Electrum, especially um, the album that we did, we recorded all that live together in one room. And so it really was like a jam session. And Mm -hmm. at the time we didn't even realize we were recording and making an album. We just thought we were making rehearsal recordings. And so, you know, listening to it now, there are even things years later when I think in retrospect, I'm like, yeah, man, if I would have known this was for the album, I would have made a different decision there. But (laughs) It, there's something raw about those recordings that I think people really appreciate too. And, and um, so, yeah, I, I hope that answers your question for me. I, I try not to compartmentalize um, my performances. So whether it's a rehearsal performance or a live performance or a studio performance, I get myself centered in the same place every time Very good. so that I can just be authentic in the moment. I love that. I love that. Um, if, for people that don't know, what was the name of your project with Prince, the, the name of the group? Okay, yeah, so um, the band was called Third Eye Girl. And when I came in to work with him, I actually um, thought that it was gonna be for his protege, Andy Allo. And she's an amazing singer songwriter, plays guitar as well. And she's been doing some amazing things lately, but um, he had just kind of, I think finished recording her album with her and producing her album and was putting her band together. And so I was kind of under the impression that I was going to be playing for her um, in this new project of his. And then he called, um, oh, rewind, Ida, the bass player for Third Eye Girl. She was already there. She had been a part of the new power generation, his, his funk band, the big band since 2010. I came in in 2012. So she was already there for two years ahead of me and so he had me and Ida and then called um um Joshua was also in on this meeting nope nope not that one he wasn't (laughs) sorry so it was me Prince and Ida um wait okay I was right so it was Joshua as well um he told Joshua and I to find the best female guitar player that was out there. And so we immediately got to Google, you know, and we were looking for female guitar players from anywhere in the world. And we came across Donna Grantis. Um, And she is a Toronto based guitarist. And um, we hit her up on Facebook and just (laughs) sent her that that email that everyone talks about getting from Princess Camp. hey, we work with Prince and actually Joshua sent it. So he said, my name is Joshua. My wife, Hannah, um, is drumming for Prince. And he asked us to find a guitar player and we came across your stuff. We really like it. We were wondering if you wanted to come out to Paisley and and jam, something like that. And um, she ended up coming out. We all, it was me, Donna and Ida and then Prince. And we all jammed and chemistry was great. Music was great. Vibe was great. And so then at that point, once Donna was out there and it had been a little while, I don't know if it was a couple days or maybe a couple weeks, never really know. Um, uh, He, he basically said, you know, I was just wondering if you guys want to, you know, be a band. And um, at that point he said, you know, go talk to your husbands about it, pray about it and get back to me. And so I talked to Joshua and it was just kind of a no brainer. And so at that point, me, Donna and Ida were jamming like all day, every day um, and learning Prince songs. He would send us set lists to go over and different songs to learn. And 
um, our first performance as, well, our first performance was at the Dakota Jazz Club in Minneapolis. And um, it was so cool because it was so intimate and Bobby Z was there. And he came up to me after the performance and he introduced himself and he said, you know, this has always been his dream. And I was like, really? And I didn't, I didn't really know what he was talking about yet. And he said, yeah, it's always been his dream to have an all female rock band. And so I've just felt so honored to hear that from, you know, his previous drummer, um, and to acknowledge that, you know, because Bobby Z was with him in Purple Rain. And so mm-hmm. he was with Prince really at the very beginning, the genesis of his career and his artistry. And so for someone who has known Prince for his entire career to say to me, um, as the drummer for his last band, we didn't know that at the time, of course, right. but he, this is what he's always wanted across a 40 year career. Now he's living his dream. And I just wow. thought it was such an honor and um, man, what a roller coaster. And just, it was, once we hit go on that thing, it was nonstop and it was so much fun. And we had actually had a couple gigs and even then our, um, we did sort of a, a first national performance, a television performance on Jimmy Fallon mm-hmm. um, with Prince. And that was our first television performance but we still didn't have a name. We didn't know what we were called. We were just, (laughs) you know, we were there. And um, what had sort of happened though, is Prince Prince had built this um, mysterious kind of culture around our band by buying this painting um, from one of his favorite artists um, that was titled Third Eye Girl. And it's just a face Um, it's the it was what was on my um, kick drums you know if you've seen any pictures or whatever of us um, performing that painting with the three eyes and um, that painting itself was named third eye girl before Prince even bought it and that painting kind of became our logo and it was super mysterious and there was these fun little uh, short films or videos that we did um sort of like who is third eye girl and we were acting and it was just really fun um but we still didn't have a name and so Jimmy Fallon when we performed he held up that album or that picture um as he was introducing us and said ladies and gentlemen third eye girl and so we all kind of looked at each other backstage and had this geek out moment where we were screaming and jumping up and down like little (laughs) girls and we're like I guess we're third (laughs) <laughs> technically technically jimmy fallon named us but i'm sure it was all a part of prince's master prophetic plan anyway yes how awesome that's that is such a cool story i love it oh it um, never gets old yeah well i'm certain i i bet you have the most amazing stories ever um okay so you also did some guitar center um a clinic tour teaching master classes. How did that yeah. come about? Yeah, so um, throughout my career, um, I had mentioned that, you know, we always went to PAS and those different conventions. Mm-hmm. And then as I got older, my dad um, started taking me out to NAM conferences and stuff like to the NAM conventions mm-hmm. um, to just continue to network and meet people. And I can't tell you how invaluable those things are to really, you know, it's not even about everyone knowing how good of a player you are at first, but actually making relationships in the music industry and and keeping in touch with people and um, just getting to know people. And so from, from those conventions, we started to make connections in the drum industry and just in the music industry in general. And and we had um, some guitar center connections that we had met through the years. And, um, I had just wanted to go on a clinic tour. It was right after I had moved to Atlanta. And so I had moved away from my bandmates and was a newlywed, but I still wanted to play and perform. And I didn't know anyone necessarily in Atlanta to really start a band and gig and all that sort of stuff. And so after talking to my dad, I said, well, you know, what if we just do a clinic tour? That way I'm still performing. I'm still traveling. I'm still being a working musician, um, but I'm not, you know, in this place where I'm having to take time to set performance aside to meet new people in Atlanta. I can just go off of what we've already built. 
And so that's how that came about. We reached out to our guitar center friends and um, the, all my endorsers, and we, we put together this clinic tour. And so I started in Atlanta. I did, um, I think, a couple shows in Illinois. I did um, Alabama, I believe, an Alabama guitar center clinic. And I did um, at least one in Texas. I may have done a couple. Um, and so I nice. was actually in the middle of that and continuing to plan and, and wanting to add to that as I got the call from Prince. Nice. And so that is what I was doing currently at that time. And then Prince called and it was just yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. You had to take that. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> so in your, in your bio, you mentioned that you write and create music for TV and movies. Is that something that you're really working on hard now since, uh, since so many things have been canceled during the pandemic? Yes. So let me tell you the Here's hardest thing I'm working on. It's okay. The hardest thing that I'm <laughs> working on right now is my three little tiny humans. Yes. Um, so after Prince passed Joshua and I, well, we were already pregnant. Um, I was 28 weeks pregnant when, when Prince passed away. And once we started our family, we realized, of course, like most musicians do with families, it's, we had a couple choices to make. Do we continue to tour and take our family on the road with us? Does one of us go and one of us stays and then, you know, miss out on that family time? Or do we figure something else out and work from home and really cultivate our family and continue to work on our careers and do music for a living? And all at that time, you know, we were going through 2016 was probably the hardest years of our lives, the hardest year of our lives to date because not only did we lose Prince, but we were living in one of his houses. Um, and we had this baby that we were bringing into the world. And so at that point, then not only were we not sure of our career and what to do, where to go from there, um, how to continue to make money. Um, but we were also, um, not sure where we were going to live because, you know, we were getting basically, you know, kicked out of a home that was just given to us by Prince. And um, there was, of course, no writing because he wasn't into contracts and stuff like that. So we were having to make these big decisions while I was pregnant and we were welcoming our, our little Azaria into the world. And um, so we had, in our time with Prince, Joshua, he was Prince's producer. If you guys don't know, um, my lovely husband, who is just so amazing, so powerful and talented, uber talented. Um, not only did I work with Prince, but Joshua also worked with Prince and became the only producer in Prince's 40 year career to share writing credit on albums. And Joshua did it not once, but twice. He also um, remastered the Purple Rain remaster with Prince that was released. Um, it was released in 2017, but they had finished it obviously before Prince passed. And so Joshua did that with Prince as well. Um, and so in that time, as I was performing and Joshua even <laughs> became the keyboard player for Third Eye Girl, um, Joshua and Prince were doing studio stuff. And one of the songs that they did together called Funk and Roll um, uh, got placed in the Empire TV show. Okay. Uh, and so Funk and Roll was, was placed in that show. And through that connection from that company, that the, the licensing company that that put Empire on or put the song on Empire, um, we were introduced um, to that person that made that deal basically. And so that's how Joshua and I were brought into the sync world is because we had that opportunity with Prince and Joshua had a song on Empire. And so Phaedra, um, who is a sister of ours from the Prince era as well, she's the one that won all his masters back for him. She's amazing and so powerful. Um, she introduced us to the company and to the person that actually struck that that licensing deal for Empire. And so through that connection, we were able to send in some of our own music and we're and that's really what we had decided to do to keep the lights on pretty much since um, 2016. And so even before the pandemic, we had been focused on licensing and getting songs placed in movies and trailers and commercials and um, TV shows and all that sort of stuff. And uh, it's been a really eye-opening experience because even though we did everything that we did with Prince in the music world, and that's such a huge accomplishment, 
in the sync world and the licensing world, it's its own industry. Mm -hmm. And so you, anytime you're kind of coming into it, you still sort of stop it, start at the, I don't want to say the bottom of the totem pole, but you know, you have to work your way up and earn your own placements and people have to like your music and want it on their product. And, um, and it's not that we were expecting any handouts or anything like that, but it was just an interesting paradox because to us, it was all the same industry. But the licensing world is really its own its own thing, and so it's, um, it's been yeah, it's been a fun journey and a learning experience for sure. Because even to a musician's ear, we create these what we believe are masterpieces and beautiful works of art, and then you know we hear what the sync companies are looking for, and it's super simple, super broken down. Um, easy tracks and we're like don't you want this masterpiece <laughs> work of art? And they're asking for super simple stuff and and it is it's just it's its own world and and you gotta train your ear to know what that world is looking for and it's it's been a journey and a learning experience but really cool and so yeah that's what we've been focused on um especially joshua i've laid some vocals for him on those and recorded some drums on the tracks but since we started having kids i've really I took a step back from really playing and performing and focusing on my career to be mom. And man, I I was, that's all I wanted anyways, at that time, you know, of course we were still with Prince. Um, Third Eye Girl had taken a break at the end of 2015 and then Prince started to do the piano and a microphone tour, his solo tour. And, but even still, you know, Joshua and I were still close to him. We still were having dinner with him, you know, frequently. And, you know, going out uh, to the movies with him and stuff like that. And so we were still very much close to him. Joshua was still mixing some of those piano and a microphone shows. So we were still close with him and never thought, you know, in a million years that, you know, what was going to happen would happen. And, um, you know, but at that time, even still, I was ready to be a mom and Prince knew that and he respected that. And and so he was excited for Azaria and loved her name and was talking about wanting to build her a school and being her godfather (laughs) Um, was just so excited for her to, to join the family. And um, so, yeah, I, I really stepped into mom and Joshua continued to really work um, and create music, but I've, you know, uh, throughout the years, of course, have been involved, just not as, as hands-on as before, of course, because, you know, you got to take care of the kids too. So, oh yeah. 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 I had to step away uh, my own self. I stepped away for quite a few years to raise my kids. My husband was in the military. So we moved around a lot. Um, So anyway, okay. So for this year, since you're working mostly from home, do you, um, do you teach, do you teach uh, like Skype lessons or do you still do like virtual master classes, anything like that? You know, I've been thinking about this actually lately because um, we've got three kids now. Azaria is four, Sovereign is two, and Genesis is 10 months and a few days. And so our kids are still very little. And um, I just recently though, let me tell you, um, my passion and my desire for really wanting to play and perform and just be more involved um, in my career has started to come back. And, you know, for those of us that are mothers, I'm sure, Tammy, you understand it's when you start having kids, your passion shifts, Absolutely. you know, to kids. Yes. And so that's where my focus really was for these last four years. And I was I was okay with that um, to a certain extent because I love my kids and I love being a mother. I love being a wife. And um, we had worked so hard with Prince. And then when he passed, even I didn't want to play for a while because I was just so taken aback by everything. Mm -hmm. And so just these last handful of months, I've really, I've felt the Lord really tugging on my heart to continue to give of myself in this arena as well. Um, And because I know that, that it's a part of my calling, it's a part of who I am. Mm -hmm. And I should be intentional with that, you know, just as intentional as I am with being a mother and being a wife and, you know, being a minister and all these other things, I got to be intentional with the other gifts that he's given me. And so I have been lately thinking about, you know, how to do Skype lessons, or how to do some sort of virtual 
anything uh Mm because that's just the reality of where we are right now and um I've always kind of been the type of person even before all the COVID stuff happened and people would ask me abroad and and just around the states do you do Skype lessons I never really liked that idea because when I teach I like to be um (laughs) don't take this the wrong way hands-on um and and just you know I like to be able to walk around the kit analyze your setup see if it's comfortable for your posture and how you should approach the kit see if you've got the drums and the cymbals and everything at a good distance so that you're not over exuding yourself and hurting your body and your muscles and then also seeing your technique from all different angles I like to get on the floor and look at how you're you know playing the bass drum and the hi-hat and how you're using your feet in a technical aspect and so I really like to be super involved in that way and and be able to see people from all angles and walk around and stuff like that. And, and digitally you're just, you're limited in that regard. And mm-hmm. um, so I was always kind of against it for myself just because of my style of teaching. And then now with all this COVID stuff, you know, it's kind of forced us all to reanalyze our perspectives a little bit. And, and so I have been thinking a bit about how I want to do lessons because I do want to um, soon open up for teaching and just interacting with people, even doing master classes. I've, I've had a couple requests to do some um, uh, virtual master classes. And so, yeah, I'm very much open to the idea. Nothing is planned yet, but um, mm-hmm. I'm working on it and just brainstorming and, and talking with Joshua because he's super creative and just even entrepreneurially, his mind just thinks differently than mine. And so he yeah. um, really always offers really good advice and, and ideas and stuff too. So I'm, I'm, my brain is working and going in that direction, but it's very new territory for me. And um, I'm excited about it though. That is exciting. I'm, 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 you let us know when that happens for you, because I, I know sure you will. have yeah. tons of people from our group that would want to get excited. Oh, yay. Part of that. I would love um, that. Finally, well, there's a couple of lessons, a couple other things. Um, yeah. You've talked about ministry several times. I know that you're a woman of faith, as I am, yeah. and um, and, and yeah, I, I've been involved in you know playing for my church since I was 14. So I've done that my oh, entire that's so life. Amazing. Um, so I know that you have a ministry called Your Will Be Done Ministries with your husband. Can you tell us anything mm-hmm. about that? Absolutely. How much time you got? <laughs> Get me on a roll here. We're here for um, you. <laughs> so um, I believe it was about three years ago now. We're coming up on our three-year anniversary. Holy cow. Um, we had just moved back to Illinois from Minnesota. Um, and Azaria, I think at that time, she was almost one. And, you know, we were doing the music thing. But after, you know, everything happened with Prince and we were having to leave the house, we actually were thinking that we were going to transition and go back to Atlanta just because that's where we were right when we mm-hmm. got the Prince call. Um, it's nicer weather. It's yeah. better living, <laughs> like living expenses and just everything, you know, we had the option. It's like, do we go to California finally, or do we go back to Illinois or do we go to Atlanta and just go down South um, and kind of pick up where we left off down there. And we definitely did not want to go back to Illinois. Um, (laughs) Not that it wouldn't have been awesome to be close to family. That was definitely the one pro. We just were kind of over the Illinois scene and the weather and, um, you know, we were headed to Atlanta in our minds, but then um, the Lord led us back to Illinois, go figure. And so at that point in that transition, we were just kind of praying, you know, what do we do? You know, do we get a place here or do we go to Atlanta? You know, um, initially our plan was, okay, we're going to stop through Illinois for a few weeks. We'll just throw our stuff up in storage, spend time with family because Um, we hadn't really had any consistent time with family um, during that whole Prince era. And so now that um, we were transitioning and Azaria was 10 months, she hadn't really spent any intimate time with family. And so we were like, okay, as we're making our way down to Atlanta, let's take the time that we have. Um, We don't have anywhere that we have to be or, you know, anything like that. Why don't we just stop for a few weeks, hang out with family and see where the Lord leads us. And so we did that. And 
um, as we were continuing to pray and just seek the Lord on what to do, he had told Joshua, you know, Joshua, he was on his infamous walks with the Lord around the neighborhood. And um, I guess God, I think the story goes, you know, the Holy Spirit had just said, your will be done ministries. And so then it was like, okay, you want us to start a church? And then more details started to just come about through revelation that it was going to be a virtual church. And so we were doing this virtual thing before everybody else, <laughs> um, because we had done this, we started this three years ago before COVID was ever even on any of our radars. And so that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to create a virtual ministry to really take off the limitations of brick and mortar and mm -hmm. open up a world for people all over the world, um, a safe space, judgment free for people to just really encounter the authenticity of the love of Christ. And, you know, there's been so many different stigmas and reputations that the institutionalized church has built over the years. And um, we really are passionate about just teaching people about God and leading them to God in a way that is understandable, relatable, and relevant to our lives today. I think so much of what we understand about church culture has been outdated and, and mm -hmm. it's a turnoff to a lot of people because people just don't see where it's relevant in their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. And so we just have a passion to show people, hey, this is what Jesus really thinks about you. And this is what he says about you. And this is his desire for you. And if you like that, come spend more time with us. And we would love to talk about the Bible with you and, and just really take down all those guards and stigmas and, and just be authentic and show people, Hey, you can love God and still have fun and enjoy your life. Yeah. And, um, it's been really awesome. We've met some really great people. We have people from over 40 plus countries now that join us. And we, um, have our, our YWBD, which stands for your will be done. Um, YWBD live, which is technically would be our Sunday service, our church service, but we go live on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. CST. And, and we chose Tuesday just because we understand that people still have their home church that they go to on Sundays and then midweek services are Wednesdays. And we didn't want to get in the way with that. We weren't trying to get people to leave their churches and come join us or anything like that. Um, we just wanted to offer another, another opportunity for people to you know, learn more about God. And, and um, so, yeah, so we, we chose Tuesday nights to just kind of add some flavor to the week for everyone. And um, we uh, it's been really, really cool. We, we also are very passionate about reaching the millennial generation and mm -hmm. now even the younger generations. And even though we've got quite a few people that join us that are older than us. I actually think the majority of the people that join us are older than us. It's been a really cool and really fun experience to get to talk to people and get to know people from all walks of life, all different kinds of denominations. And um, everyone is welcome. And, and even in our live services with the chats and stuff, the chat room that goes on and everything, you know, people are honest about their experiences um, in church or lack of church growing up and church hurt, um, but family ties that have hurt them and turned them away from the Lord. And um, it's been a really, really, really blessed opportunity to just get to spend some time with a bunch of different people, you know, on a that. weekly basis. Well done. Well done. I'm so yeah. happy for you. Yay, that's you. that's so wonderful. Is there a possibility that you could in the chat here um, drop some links for us so that people can know how to find you and support you on social media, support your ministry, support yeah. uh, your music. And um, I know that as people watch this and I put it on our YouTube channel and instant all that, um, they're going to mm -hmm. want to find everything about you so that they can follow you a little better. Um, yeah, so I'm excited about that. Absolutely. I will. Um, I'm typing. Sorry if I look crazy. I'm no, typing no. my um, uh, Instagram handle now. So my personal Instagram is Hannah J. Welton. And then the ministry Instagram is at YWBD Men, short for ministry. Um, sorry, I'm trying to type it back. Um, That's YWBD okay. Men. That's that one. That's our Instagram info. And then our Perfect. Facebook is actually the same. So if you go to facebook.com 
um, and then just backslash at uh, YWBD men. It'll okay. take you to the same to our Facebook page. And that's actually where we go live on Tuesday night. Great. Um, is that link there? And Perfect. I also have on Facebook the Hannah Welton fan page. Um, yes. I'm just not sure what the actual URL is for that yet. But if you just type in like Hannah Welton fan page, I think you You'll can find right that too. Yeah. Sorry, I did not come prepared with links. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I should have, I should have <laughs> okay, asked about I'm that. Sorry. Um, before we leave, um, is there anyone here that's with us live that has a question for Hannah? Yeah. Anybody? Hey, this is Debbie Flood. Um, we're friends on hey. Facebook, but I've never actually had the opportunity to meet you. So I'm glad I'm getting this opportunity to really get to know you. Um, yeah, and awesome. uh, I'm really excited about listening to your ministry stuff because I just actually became a Christian. So thank you for sharing that. Yay, um, my, my, the Lord. my actual question is this though. So, um, there's a few, which actually Liz is also, we live in Nashville. Would you ever consider coming down and doing a clinic for us there? Totally. Um, I actually, was it forks drum shop? Is that in Nashville or is that in? Memphis? It is absolutely. Yeah. That's in Nashville. Okay. Yeah. So I actually went on a clinic tour, um, uh, right after we got married and went to Forks and it was a really cool experience. I had a really great time. So I'm, I'm always open. Um, I think it just kind of depends on the timing and the setting and the logistics around it, but absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks for uh, sharing that. I'll, yeah. I'll see what I can do. I'll talk to the guys out there. Of course. I, I go there. Of course. Amazing. Thanks. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. Anybody else? No. Okay. So Hannah, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank I you. appreciate you so much. I, I think this was such a fun, uh, fun interview. And um, I will be sharing the link with you once I get it um, edited down and uh, put it together so that we could share it on social media. And that way you can share it as well if you'd like Beautiful. to. Beautiful. Um, yeah. And then if, if while everybody else leaves, if you will stay on for me for a second, I have one question for you after everybody else checks out. So thank totally. you guys for being thank here you, with ladies. us. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate it so much um, that you took your time to be with us and uh, and that you join us all the time for all these interviews. So uh, I appreciate you. I hope you have a wonderful uh, Tammy, rest of your day. Yes. Tammy, can I ask Hannah a question? Hi, Hi Hannah. Hannah. I'm a fan Hi. of you. Um, I just, when uh, Debbie was talking about Nashville, um, the Nashville NAM summer NAM show is coming up. Maybe you might consider going there. July. Yeah, you know, I've never actually been to Summer Nam. I've I only been to Winter Nam. Um, it's closer. Yeah, it just kind of de it it depends. I mean, if it's um, a performing opportunity versus just going and spending time, you know, I have to weigh all the options now with the kids and scheduling mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So, like I said, I'm always open to checking out. Um, requests or or I don't want to say requests it makes me feel like <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah I'm always open to different opportunities it just depends on the timing is is all so if there's you know something specific and you guys want to send somebody um my way um to talk about it and go over the logistics I'm, I'm always open for that the okay. other the better op would be just so you know it, there's actually a drum show coming up it's, it's a big drum show and Chicago. summer nam is like kind of iffy i just want to be honest with you guys like it's not like winter nam like yeah dw isn't even there different. like yeah, I mean, yeah I i've DW. been there it, it it yeah you're right it's i've been not there, the same it's fun. but it this, is fun yeah it's fun but the the, the better op is actually going to be that drum show there's a big drum show coming up i've got to find the date i'll ping you that hannah maybe we can work that out i would love to beautiful. actually meet you in person so we'll try to work that out beautiful yeah cool. for sure Nashville. all right you guys Thank you so much. Um, I, I appreciate you being here and we will see each other at the next um, interview, which I think is next week. So thank you guys. Bye. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.